Tonight on KQED Newsroom, the U.S. is set to impose tariffs on Mexico on Monday as the number of migrants caught at the border surged to record levels. Also, we talked to East Bay Assembly member Rob Bonta about his key legislative priorities ranging from housing to schools. And a new book profiles four remarkable women who shattered the glass ceiling in the male-dominated world of Silicon Valley. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. We begin with tense talks over tariffs and immigration. President Trump is threatening to hit Mexican imports with tariffs starting Monday as Customs and Border Protection officials announced that arrests at the border had surged to a 13-year high. It's also the fourth straight month the agency has broken its record for family arrests. Meanwhile, Mexican officials are negotiating with their American counterparts to avert tariffs by agreeing to boost immigration enforcement. They're also considering changing asylum rules to make it easier to deport Central American migrants apprehended at the border. Here now to discuss these issues are Santa Clara University Law Professor Deep Gula Sekaram and Sean Walsh, a Republican strategist with Wilson Walsh Consulting. Nice to have both of you back. Thank you. So here's what's being laid out by U.S. and, and Mexican officials. Uh, migrants would have to seek asylum in the first safe country they enter. So for Guatemalans, they would have to apply in Mexico. For people from El Salvador and Honduras, they would need to apply in Guatemala rather than in the U.S. Deep, what do you think of this plan? So certainly United States immigration law provides for the United States' ability to negotiate with other countries and, and have those countries take migrants who might be coming in. The United States has such an agreement with Canada. But a critical part of that provision is that the country has to be safe. It's unclear right now whether this would actually be safe given the fact that Mexico and Central American countries are experiencing record levels of crime and homicide. Sean, what do you think? Well, we have an immigration problem in this country that is out of control. And people thought that the numbers of migrants coming in would actually decrease under Trump with the tough rhetoric and the talk about building a wall. But they've done just the opposite. They've been increasing. And the costs associated with the undocumented immigrants in the country are increasing as well. California is flush with money at this juncture, and Gavin Newsom is putting in many programs designed to support undocumented immigrants. So but something's got to give. But would a plan like this work to decrease the amount of the number of migrants trying to cross the border? Well, sure. I actually give President Trump credit. I mean, he's using the trade policy to affect another major policy issue that he wants to have happen. And if you have to enter into the first country after you flee your country if you are purportedly having a problem with regards to your your safety or your well-being. Uh, I disagree. I think many of the migrants, and when people are interviewed down at the border, many of the migrants are coming for economic benefits. I understand it. The economies in those Central American countries are very, very poor. But they are trying to flee countries, though, that have horrible violence and unrest going on. They are. But the issue is, is the United States, should it be the recipient of unregulated immigration. And I think that we need to make determinations about people who can come into the country and regulate. I will tell you, the Democrats in Congress and many Democrats in the state of California will regulate everything from your toothbrush to your toothpaste to every other issue. Yet they want no regulation in an immigration system. And it costs this country billions of dollars. It costs the state billions of dollars. Deep, you were recently at the border visiting migrant detention centers. Uh, what did you see? And do you, do you agree with Sean that, that these migrants are uh, fleeing primarily for econ economic reasons? Yeah, so I think, first of all, I think it's a caricature to suggest that any political uh, body doesn't want to regulate the border at all. I don't think, I simply don't think that's true. But one of the things that you understand when you're at the border, when you see the detention facilities, when you're on the other side of the U.S.-Mexico border, is that uh, that our immigration policy, our enforcement-heavy immigration policy, fundamentally misunderstands the reasons for migration. The fact that somebody might be coming and fleeing desperate economic circumstances is not mutually exclusive with the fact that they are also running from dire, just safety circumstances. We're talking about nearly failed states when we're talking about Northern Triangle uh, places. The fact is people don't want to migrate. Only 3% of the world lives in a place where they were not born. What you see are families with very small children, many of them underneath the age of two years old, making a 2,000-mile very dangerous trip for the opportunity, the chance, 
to maybe run away from their country. So I don't think it's as simple as saying people are running simply for economic reasons. Let me talk about two other provisions that are being tossed out here, which is, one, Mexico is also offering to expand an American program requiring asylum seekers to wait in Mexico while their asylum claims are, are being adjudicated. And it's also pledging to send 6,000 troops to the border uh, with Guatemala. Sean, the president has said all along that he wants Mexico to come up with a way to put a complete stop to illegal immigration. Will these provisions be enough to convince the president to go along? Well, Mexico has come a long way. I mean, I think some of the issues that are on the table are pretty impactful. The question with Donald Trump is, is anything ever enough? I'm not sure uh, if, unless Mexico comes up with a big, you know, five foot tall check mm -hmm. saying I'm paying for the wall. That may not be, be enough for Donald Trump, but these are very impactful uh, public policy uh, issues that are being uh, put forward by the Mexican government. Well, and also impactful public policy um, shifts being put forward by the U.S. as well. President Trump tying immigration to the threat of tariffs is a new approach by a U.S. president. Do you think there will be legal challenges uh, over this deep? And if so, on what grounds? Well, you could certainly challenge on the basis as to whether the agreement guarantees safety uh, that is to say, again, that the, the third country has to be a safe place for the migrants to, to come. So I think that is going to be one area where people might push back on, on such an agreement. Certainly there are people who, even if given safe, uh, a, a place to stay in Mexico, Mexico may not be safe for them given the narco trafficking and gangs in, in Mexico. The other thing I'd say is that Mexico has for some time been interested in controlling its own border. As I'm, uh, uh, last year they deported 85,000 Central Americans back to Central America. Mexico certainly doesn't have an interest in uh, not regulating its own border. So I do think there's overall a capacity concern here. If the United States, as one of the wealthiest countries in the entire world, has trouble controlling its border, it's an open question as to how a country like Mexico, much less well-resourced, can control its border. And Sean, many American businesses re rely on Mexican imports, and this tariff will hit them hard. California is a top importer of Mexican goods. $44 billion worth of goods flowed last year from Mexico. How big a dilemma is this for Republicans who are adamantly opposed to illegal immigration on the one hand, but are also concerned about how tariffs will affect our economy? Well, Republicans generally are not in favor of tariffs. They're in favor of free flow of trade and goods. But there are costs. So in California, the last major study that was done in 2017 said that uh, undocumented immigrants were costing the United States around $125 billion and California $23 billion. So even though you may pay more for goods and services, where is the cost being borne out by the taxpayers. So there's additional costs by providing services to people who are not in this country legally. And so how much more are those costs really when you equate in or factor in uh, the increases in tariffs? Deep, do you want to add to that? No, I'd just say that, you know, if we think, if we're trying to think about migration and, and how to control it, at the end of the day, no matter what type of policy we have in the United States, it is, I think, a fantasy to believe that we can unilaterally control migration. When people are fleeing the circumstances that people are fleeing in Central American countries, that is not something that's going to be deterred by a wall, high enforcement, all the things we're already doing. That's why people keep coming, despite knowing that they might die. Meanwhile, the Trump administration is cutting back on services for unaccompanied children in migrant shelters. The Office of uh, Refugee Resettlement is now canceling English classes, legal aid, also recreational activities like soccer. Uh, what kind of far-reaching consequences could these policies have, Deep? So first, you have some legal concerns, I think. The federal government can keep children only underneath a, a, a negotiated settlement called the Flores Agreement. That has certain restrictions on how the federal government has to treat children in its custody. Beyond that, the Flores Agreement requires that any state that or any place where these uh, children are held has to comply with other uh, state regulations about how to have children. 
those regulations themselves would require things like education, other types of classes, recreation activities, et cetera. And so there might be some immediate legal uh, concerns with that policy. More far-reaching, you're taking a vulnerable population, one that has typically, underneath both Republican and Democratic administrations, been treated differently than the other parts of the immigrant detained population and treating them just like the adult immigrant detained population. And that's quite problematic. Okay, I have to move on to DACA. Uh, on a related front, the House passed legislation this week to grant a path to citizenship uh, for about two and a half million DACA recipients and also people with temporary protected status. Uh, it's almost certain to die in the Republican-led Senate, Sean. Um, so why do you think the Democrats are doing this? What message are they trying to send? Well, 2020 elections coming up, and they're trying to appeal to a certain constituency. Uh, when Deep said that there's no way to control migration, I think that's wrong. Uh, Israel put up a, a fence, a barrier, and they were able to control migration and terror attacks on their own country. I do believe that if you use a border barrier, you have technology, and you enforce through Real ID, you can cut down significantly the number of people coming into the country illegally. With regards to DACA, um, what's important, in my view, and if I were a Republican advising the the Senate uh, leader, Mr. McConnell, I would say don't go along with DACA. DACA is something the Democrats desperately want from a PR perspective. It should be put on the table with chain migration and a whole host of other immigration issues in a compre comprehensive immigration reform package, which would yeah. include funding the wall. But what are the chances a comprehensive plan, the sort that Sean is talking about, will pass? I mean, so many presidents have tried and they failed deep. There is zero chance it's going to pass, at least in the near future. The only part of any uh, comprehensive immigration reform uh, proposal that has enjoyed significant uh, bipartisan support has been DREAM Act legislation, which at one time was supported by several Republicans, in fact introduced by several Republicans. This particular proposal is going nowhere, but it is a piece that could be passed. All right. We will have to leave it there. Thanks to both of you, Deep Kulasekaram with Santa Clara University and Sean Walsh with Wilson Walsh Consulting. Nice to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you. Now to state politics. Since 2012, Rob Bonta has served in the California State Assembly representing the East Bay. He's also the first Filipino-American ever elected to the California legislature. Since then, he's tackled a number of issues, one of them being the Bay Area's housing crisis. His bill, AB 1481, would impose a requirement that landlords show just cause before they can evict renters. Another measure would abolish prisons run by private companies, a bill that Governor Jerry Brown shot down last year due to California's overcrowding concerns. Critics of for-profit prisons say they lack both safety and accountability. And Assembly Member Rob Bonta joins me now in the studio. Nice to have you here. Thanks for having me, Tweet. So let's t uh, begin with the housing crisis. As we all know, we have a serious one in a serious one in California, including the Bay Area. Your bill would put in place a just cause eviction mandate, but it would also allow tenants to challenge an eviction. So how serious is that problem? Renters being unfairly evicted. It's a big problem right now. We're in a state of emergency, a state of crisis. We need to use all the tools in the toolbox to protect our, our tenants. And right now, tenants are getting hurt on a lot of different ways. One is by having rents raised uh, incredibly to incredibly high rates so that they are essentially economically evicted. They can't pay that new rent. Or, and also, they are being evicted for reasons that are not fair and not just. This bill is, is very simple, but it's also very powerful. It just says you need to be, when you're evicted, if you're evicted, it needs to be for a fair and just reason. Not a discriminatory reason, not a retaliatory reason, not an arbitrary reason. That will keep a lot of Californians in their homes. But, you know, some realtors and landlords have criticized this approach. They say that the legislature's approach to trying to fix the housing crisis is by focusing too much on measures that protect renters and not enough on streamlining processes uh, to create more housing. We need to do both. We are doing both. We have done a lot on the supply side. We had a housing bond passed a couple years ago. We had a recording fee passed, all to generate more housing, create more uh, production, more supply. Uh, we also had streamlining passed that helps get more supply uh, for affordable housing up faster. We've done that. What we haven't done yet is is important uh, take important steps to protect our tenants so it's it's um, a little bit awkward to hear that that criticism given all that we've done on the supply side and all that we continue to do we will do both uh, but we haven't done enough to protect tenants yet and we must let's talk about criminal justice you have a bill that would phase out uh, the use of California's private prisons by 2028 why do you think this is necessary 
For-profit private prisons are wrong. They have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to maximize profits. So they're cutting corners every way they can on their workers, on the services that they provide to um, the, the, the inmates. We need to make sure that these Californians, when they get out of prison, are ready to be successful and re-enter society and that our recidivism rates are, are low and that we, we have successful re-entry. That's but, not but, happening with for-profit private But the GEO group, which runs you know, four private prisons in California, say that they are doing that, that your criticism is unfair. Um, they say they help to reduce recidivism by focusing on rehab and support services for inmates even after they get out. Do you not believe them? <laughs> The, the, the facts sh show that not to be true, and the structure, the whole set of incentives for, for a for-profit private prison, they're literally traded on Wall Street. They have a fiduciary duty. Their duty is to maximize profits for their shareholders. So they're not maximizing the investments in Californians. That's who we care about. That's who we should care about. Uh, Californians who are in prison now, who will get out later, who need to make sure that they have the skills, the training, the education, the rehabilitation, uh, the human resource investments to be successful when they get out. They're simply not doing that. And the facts show that the, 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 the assaults between uh, prisoners and, and, and other prisoners is higher in for-profit for-profit private prisons, the assaults on guards are, are higher. Uh, the training and skill level of uh, workers in for-profit pr private prisons is lower. So almost on every indi um, indicia, um, they lose. But there are you know, there are nearly 4,000 prisoners right now, right. right, in private prisons. So if, if your bill goes through, where will they all go? Because already counties are saying, don't put them in, don't send them to us because under realignment we already have more people that would have been in the state prisons but now they're in our facilities and we are we're seeing a much more dangerous population now at the county level there are four thousand plus prisoners in for-profit private prisons there should be zero and uh, the reason that we use for-profit private prisons in California initially was because we had a court-mandated cap above which we, we couldn't have um, prisoners in our, in, our, in our prison system, and so we had to do something else. I think we should have done it differently then, but we can still correct it now. We can work with our county jails. We can work with our city jails. We've done a study. There is massive capacity, thousands of uh, beds of capacity throughout the state of California where we can contract voluntarily with counties who wish to have uh, prisoners who are now in for-profit private prisons come to their facility and get good services, get good support, uh, get good rehabilitation investments. That's what we should be doing. It should be a public facility, not a for-profit private one. All right, let's uh, move on to education because as the school year nears an end, we've seen all year that one of the most divisive issues has been the charter schools issue. Uh, you're the co-sponsor of a bill that would make it harder to open a new charter school or expand an existing one. What are your concerns about charter schools? We started an experiment over 20 years ago with, with uh, charter schools that uh, I think there's been a lot of unintended consequences since then. And it's time to, to, to pause, to, to look at what we've done. Make what are sure those consequences? That, well, we're draining our, the, financially our school districts. We have more and more uh, students going to, for, uh, going to charter schools. And, and when they do, we lose the economies of scale and, and the, the economic benefits uh, in our traditional public school systems. They're literally draining financially our, our public schools. The districts lose funding because there are fewer students. Fewer students, um, more facilities to, to, to operate. Um, we've also, one of the ideas behind charter schools was to innovate and do things differently, do things better, have better student achievement, and then bring that back into our traditional public schools. It's not going back to our traditional public schools. It's staying in a corner of the district at a, at a single charter school or a single set of charter schools. The innovation is not getting, there's no feedback loop back to the traditional public schools. So, But, but even, even in your own district, right, in Oakland, 27% of students in the Oakland Unified School District are in charter schools. That is the largest proportion of students in any large school districts in California. There are lots of parents who feel like that gives them choice. It gives them choice of quality schools and, you're, and that your proposal is taking that away from them. It's not though because uh, it doesn't affect good charter schools that exist. It's, it's, our bill applies to new authorizations of new charter schools that don't even exist right now. There's no students in them. There's no families that, that support them or that go to them. If you're a good existing charter school, you will continue to be a good existing charter school because you'll be authorized by the same authorizer who authorized you before. What my bill does is it simply says we should have local control. Uh, we should have school district boards making decisions about the schools in their district and that when they do, they should be able to consider things like financial impact of the new charter school, the facilities impact and the academic impact. That seems exceedingly reasonable to me to, to prohibit a school board member or school board from considering the financial impact of a decision that they're making 
is incredibly counterintuitive and uh, to me violates the fiduciary duty of a school board member whose job is to make sure there's, there's uh, financial health in their school district. All right, Assemblyman Rob Bonta of Oakland, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Twee. And now to tech. The struggles of women in Silicon Valley are well documented, from gender pay gaps at tech giants such as Google and Amazon, to sexual harassment to raising capital for their startups. A new book, Alpha Girls, profiles four fearless females who years ago shattered stereotypes and barriers in the tech industry, helping to launch businesses and platforms that revolutionized how we work and connect online. Here now in the studio to talk about these tech trailblazers is author Julian Guthrie. Julian, nice to have you here. Nice to be here. Thank you. Well, by now, the dismal statistics around women and venture capital are pretty well publicized. 94% uh, of investing partners at venture firms are men, and less than 2% of venture capital go to startups founded by women. Was that one of the reasons why you decided to write this book? No, I really got into it. You know, journalists want to tell stories that haven't been told. And when I was around publicizing my last book, How to Make a Spaceship, I was, I would see these huge groups of people, uh, entrepreneurs, engineers, rocket scientists, aviation folks, and there would be so, so few women. And I thought these are such dynamic industries. Where are all the women? And I started to look more in my own backyard at tech and then at more of a, um, this world of venture capital that I see as having this kind of outsized influence, but is little understood. And I learned that fact that when I started my reporting, 94% of all investing partners were men, but that made me think, well, there are 6% who are women and have succeeded. And how did they do it? And what does the world look like to them? And what is it like to be the only woman at the table, the only woman chasing down the these deals. And the women you profiled may not be household names, but certainly the companies and the ventures they were involved in building are very well known. Companies like Salesforce, Google, the um, venture firms, uh, IVP and Menlo Ventures, and so much more. Were there some common threads that ran through their stories of struggle and success? Well, the struggles are very um, interesting as well as the successes. I would say first, commonalities in terms of their successes. They used humor to diffuse tense situations. I think that's a powerful mm -hmm. kind of mechanism. MJ Elmore, she's one of the alpha girls and she's she from- in the VC firm IVP? Right, exactly. And she came from Indiana and she I love this opening scene where she drives west in this old Ford Pinto. The floorboards are so rusted out she can see Sand Hill Road <laughs> rushing by below. She goes on to become one of the first women partners in venture capital. Um, and she is tasked at age 28 approximately with firing an entrepreneur who's twice her age. And the entrepreneur, uh, they're one-on-one -on -one meeting and she has just found out that he's sleeping with one of his employees and she tells him, you have problems with the company and now this has happened, you're fired. And he looks at her and he says, I'm not gonna be fired by a woman. And she thinks, well, he's fine being funded by a woman, but he won't be fired by a woman. And instead of like taking issue with his really clueless uh, remark, she said to him, well, I don't see anyone else here. I am all you've got. But that wasn't only a win for her, like in how she handled it, using yeah. humor, using kind of lightness, brevity. Uh, when she went back to her firm, all men, they looked at this because she was the only, because the, these women were really the only one, yeah. only women at the table. The male partners at IVP looked at it as though this is how other women would handle mm. the same situation. So it was in that way, kind of this incremental gain, not just for MJ, but for women. Yeah. Well, what were some of the most surprising things that you learned about these women after you talked to them? Actually, it was all surprising to me because it really opened my eyes to how women in male-dominated industries succeed, and it translates from Silicon Valley and tech to industries across the country, really. Um, so it transcends, really, place and time. The way they succeeded was very different from how the success that I had studied kind of written about in past books by these trailblazers. These women were able to succeed kind of incrementally, one step at a time. I've glommed onto this term called tempered radicals, where they were able to have these small victories, like what I described with MJ, where it wasn't just a win for them, it was a win for others. But, but they also had like, Things that, you know, we in journalism, because you spent 20 years at the San Francisco Chronicle as a reporter, right, are your byline is my, your byline, my on-air work is my on-air work, but they were 
in these meetings, they were wondering, should I speak up? Should I take notes? And those are things that I hadn't really thought about. Well, and I was also lucky to work in a newsroom where it was very much a meritocracy. And that was another thing that surprised me about the ridiculous barriers that exist for women. And whether it's uh, being taken seriously in a meeting or whether it's working with entrepreneurs or walking into a boardroom and what are you wearing and do, you know, is it commented on? But, you know, these women also had, you had asked about commonalities. You know, they, they had um, this sort of eyes on the prize mentality. If there were these barriers, they found a way around them, through them or over them. And, you know, so they kept this sort of, yeah. this sense of where do I want to get to? And they just, Teflon suits, let, let the rest of it kind of wash off. So, so they've paved the way, but you know, the statistics that we've both pointed out is still mm -hmm. dismal in terms of uh, you know, representation by women in the tech and venture industries. So what do you think needs to happen in order to uh, have women in the tech workforce feel like there is parity and there are opportunities for them the way that men have? Well, I think it's the same thing in, in industries beyond tech as well, and that is that, first of all, women need to tell their own stories, and they need to be brave, like the women of Alpha Girls told me their stories, and they told it with hurts and insults and injuries and betrayals and successes and all. But women need to tell their stories, and we need to tell other women's stories. I read a fact that we have 3,500 years of recorded history, and 0.5% of that has been dedicated to the stories of women. Mm -hmm. So also what is happening now, though, is these women who went from what I call navigating to pioneering, they now are creating this network, this sisterhood. They're founding women-run venture firms, women-run investment platforms. They're investing in women-founded firms at unprecedented levels. So it's really about you know, making sure you uh, are speaking to this really important demographic, including it. Companies show that the more diverse uh, a company is in the top ranks, the more profitable it is as well. And just real quickly, your research for this book had already begun when the Me Too movement uh, happened. What impact did it have on your reporting? Did it bring about a change in the women you interviewed? I think more women were slightly more willing to share their stories, but it was still the hardest part of this yeah. book to get the women to share their missteps and to share the hurts. And I felt so strongly that that was really important to be honest in this story. And you did a great job bringing Thank that you. out. And I know that it's going to be adapted for a TV series, so congratulations It on is, that. and by an extraordinary yeah. Alpha Girl woman producer. Yeah. All right, Julian Guthrie, author of Alpha Girls. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that will do it for us. As always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thank you for joining us.